Uh, we would go like, on, we, would, talk, go on. we would like to talk to you. Do you admit that you abused small girls in your care, Mr. McGuire? What do you have to say? Do you have any remorse? That was me in a doorstep for the BBC's Panorama programme almost ten years ago. I was one of the team who tracked down a couple called Jane and Alan Maguire to their home in a tiny village in southern France. What about your wife, Mr Maguire? She was being cruel to children. She was making them drink disinfectant. Alan, a large man, squared up to the camera while his wife hid in their car. The pair had once been accused of cruelty to vulnerable children in their care in a state-funded home in Jersey. They were just two among many child abusers, mostly care staff or foster parents, who got away with their crimes over decades. This is the story of how that was allowed to happen and how some fear it's happening even now. I have always taken the view that we should look after our own looked after children in the same way as we look after our own children. We need to improve that. Every time we're told lessons have been learned, but very often they're the same lessons and I don't believe they've learned the lessons. If one case can be said to stand for all that was wrong about Jersey's childcare, it is that of the Maguires and the terrified children placed in their hands. For years, a group of boys and girls lived in constant fear of being beaten with wooden spoons or having their mouths washed out with soap. Yet in 1990, when staff blew the whistle, Jane Maguire's boss simply moved the couple out and gave Jane another job in contact with children. It took seven years for them to be charged with assault and brought to court. But then the island's top legal officer, the Attorney General, decided there wasn't enough evidence to get a conviction. It was believed, too, that Alan Maguire had terminal cancer. One of the little girls ill-treated by the Maguires was Danny Jarman, Sadly, she died two years ago, aged 34. But in 2008, she told the BBC how upset she was the trial was stopped. I didn't want to go through with it in the first place, and then I managed to build up the courage to actually speak out and come out about what had happened. And um, there was evidence there to prove that what had happened did happen, and a lot of it was never brought up in court. Nine years later, in 2008, with cameras rolling, I confronted the couple near their remote French home. You've ruined the lives of many children in Jersey. Do you have any remorse at all? I got no answer. That big owl was alive came as a surprise to many in Jersey, who assumed his cancer had claimed him. The police pressed for extradition, but it never happened. Had Mr Maguire returned to the island, he might well have faced charges of sexual abuse as well as assault. The claim had been made by one of the girls in his care to the police way back in 1997, but he was never charged. Alan Collins is a lawyer who is currently representing 28 Jersey victims of abuse in the island's homes. Regardless of the rightness or wrongness of that decision not to prosecute, it was toxic. People who had done wrong, who were known to have done wrong, were able to get away with it, and it feeds back into this feeling amongst many survivors that they don't matter quite as much as other people. This feeling of we are second class compared to everybody else and it just goes on and on. We were treated as second class people when we were in care and we continue to be treated as second class people um, even when wrongdoing comes to light. One of Danny's friends at the home was Darren Pico who stood up for Danny and got the brunt of the Maguire's cruelty. Well, anything I did wrong, I had to stand out in the back garden with my nose to a tree for about five, six, seven, eight hours, doesn't matter, rain or shine. Sometimes I was there till 11, 12 o'clock at night, but my nose was not allowed to leave the tree until they told me to get him. That was down the tree. Nobody else had to do that? No. Nope. Just me. You were picked on, weren't you? Yeah. By the Maguire's? Yeah. Why? Because I fought back. Because I wasn't going to be taken down so easily, so I fought back and every time I did, I got more punished and more punished and more punished. That's why they did it. I met Darren on his first visit back to Jersey for years. Understandably, he has no fond memories of home. I hate the place. I can't be more honest than that. It's not my uh, favourite place on the planet, to be honest. You went to... Um 
a child psychiatric unit. Yes. Because they said that you were an angry problem child. Yes. What was that like? Better than where I was. I enjoyed it. It was nice. I wasn't getting the kick in. I wasn't standing with my nose to a tree. And I was actually treated really nice. And that's why they said, you can go home now. There's nothing wrong with that boy. It's a load of rubbish kind of thing. And I didn't want to go home. I wanted to stay there. I felt good. It was Danny who had brought the Maguires to police attention by throwing a rock through their window wrapped in a damning message for them. Alan Maguire took it to the police, who investigated him and his wife instead. Eventually, because of Danny, a yes. court case started, didn't it? Yes, fair play to Danny. Lots of love, Danny. Sadly, she's no longer with us. Yes, I miss you, Danny. And she was very brave. Very. And started If action. it wasn't for Danny, none of this would be here now. So when the court case came to an end, how did you feel? I didn't. I really didn't. I didn't know what to. Um, be, uh, I don't know, but one thing I do know is it didn't feel gone. Now we know the true scale of the abuse, the many other victims and the many other perpetrators who evaded justice for years. There was house parent Leslie Hughes, who began his indecent abuse of young girls in his care home in 1969. He wasn't imprisoned until 20 years later, when one of his victims, abused from the age of six, finally came forward. And just this year, a retired teacher, Chris Bacon, was jailed for indecently assaulting six boys in the 1970s and 80s. This predatory paedophile's offences had been known about in 1985, yet he was simply cautioned and quietly allowed to resign. So how did Jersey find itself having to dissect its own murky post-war past so publicly, considering it managed to ignore that past for so long? I've come to the island to find out. Excuse me, sir, can you spare me a couple of minutes? Sorry, I'm late for work. The inquiry was promised in the aftermath of what was dubbed the House of Horrors scandal. As I'll explain later, that rather overblown phrase refers to the police investigation centred on the island's largest children's home, Eau de la Garenne. Today, after two years of hearings and a seven-month wait, the eminent panel is ready to reveal its findings. Politicians have been bracing themselves, preparing with taxpayer-funded media training. I'm trying to ask some local people for their opinions, but it's rush hour and they're all so busy. Excuse me, sir. No, I've got time, I'm sorry. Oh, OK, I'm making a program for the BBC. Yeah. Okay. It's this lady. Excuse me, hello. I work for the BBC. I'm making a program. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Do you, do you know what day it is today? Uh, Monday. Do you know why it's special today? Uh, it's Independence Day in America. Is it? Um, do you know that the child inquiry is due to report today, the independent care inquiry into children? No. You haven't heard about it? No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry. The gentleman here, I might ask. Excuse me, sir. Um, do you know what is special about today? No. Do you know it's the report of the independent child care inquiry today? Yeah, and how to, from how to come. Yeah. And, and, and are you interested at all in what it's going to say? Would be, but most of it would be covered up, wouldn't it? Well, I, I, to be honest, growing up here, I hadn't even heard of it um, growing up. And when it, when it first came out, I was horrified and sickened that that, that kind of thing was, was allowed to happen. Um, so hopefully justice will be served. There's a taxi driver here. Let's see if he wants to talk to me. Hello, sir. Morning, I'm making a little programme for BBC Radio. Um, overall, I'm interested in the bigger picture of politics in the island. However, uh, what we're seeing quite often is the Jersey Way. And what is the Jersey Way? Well, um, as an example, apparently there's now going to be some sort of review of uh, judicial appointments in the island. And funnily enough, the people who are doing the review are mostly judges. So, it's a bit like turkeys and Christmas, isn't it? 
Ah, the Jersey Way. I'll be finding out more about that. But first, I'm off to the press conference. It's a strange event, though. We're not allowed to take in our phones or record anything for two hours. We can't leave either until the report goes public this afternoon. Apparently the politicians are getting the same briefing as the press, but in another room upstairs. Only another few minutes to wait. Well, I'm going into the building now, so I have to turn off my recorder and my phone, put them away, and we wait to see what the report says. The verdict, damning. Children have been powerless for decades. Failure is written on every page. Other words are malaise, inexcusable, inadequate. The remedy? First, a commissioner for children. Independent inspection, modernised legislation, better staff. The overarching message, though, is that Jersey's culture, its attitude to children, has to change. Children have to be given a voice. So I'm wondering, have I witnessed a moment of history? Will this mark a turning point? I can't answer that without first going back to where this extraordinary 10-year saga turned from being a little local difficulty into a worldwide scandal and Jersey's biggest ever police investigation, Operation Rectangle. It's a fine summer's day and I'm leaving St Helier and driving through narrow country roads up the hill from Gorey Castle. Oh, I think there's a left turn here. Yeah, there we go. My destination is a large four-sided granite building which became the focus for the police investigation into child abuse and even possible child murder. Eau de la Garenne. Well, it's a long time since I've been here. I don't quite know if I'm going the right way. Oh my. There it is. This brings back memories. Eau de la Garenne. Better go out and have a look. It's known to older TV viewers as the cop shop in Bergerac with suave John Nettles as the detective who always got his man. In 2008, for a few frenzied weeks, the home where disturbed, deprived or just dumped kids were once sent was as infamous as the black hole of Calcutta. Well, it appears that Haute de la Garenne is now an activity centre. But back in 2008, it was very different. I remember that here in front of the gates, blocking the lane, there was a makeshift camp of TV satellite trucks and camera crews, reporters and snappers, all hustling for news. Inside, hidden from our sight, we knew the forensic experts in their white suits were digging. Sometimes we'd see the sniffer dogs, hyper-alert spaniels, being brought out for another session. They were searching for human blood. The policeman who stood right here and lit the blue touch paper was Deputy Chief Officer Lenny Harper. This morning, just after 9.30, uh, we discovered uh, what appears to be uh, partial uh, remains of a child. It was an irresistible story, and it encouraged nearly 200 victims to come forward, many for the first time. The BBC got the first TV crew inside the building and was able to film the digging out of the foundations and the concrete quadrangle where children used to play. Among the tons of earth and rubble, they found 65 teeth from small children, some drops of blood, and that potential bit of skull. Later finds included child-sized human bones. We're in there now, and uh, we've had a quick look. Uh, and as I say, we've had an indication from the uh, from the dog. Jersey's politicians, more used to Bergerac-style policing than Lenny's up yours attitude, were overwhelmed by the media interest. They had in fact known that the police had begun a secret child abuse inquiry in mid-2007, first looking at allegations of abuse within the sea cadets, then persistent rumours about Haute de la Garenne. But just like the Spanish Inquisition, nobody had expected this. I'm sorry if that sounds flippant, but there were moments when things descended into undignified farce. This is the then Chief Minister, Frank Walker, and his former Health and Social Services Minister, Stuart Sivray, clashing publicly before and after 
an interview conducted from BBC Radio Jersey. Frank, we're talking about dead children. Yes, you, exactly. So you shouldn't be politicising it. You should now be throwing your support behind the police and behind every effort to find out Indeed, who was I, responsible. I have. I've repeated no, the you're trying to sharp Jersey internationally. Stuart Sivray had made himself unpopular with Frank Walker and other ministers in July 2007 when he told the states that children in care were being failed by the very people supposed to be protecting them. His evidence came from two sources. One, a serious case review into how a 12-year-old boy had been abused by two men for 18 months. The other, a whistleblower working in the juvenile remand home called Greenfields, once known as Le Chien. The States was horrified at what Mr Sivray was telling them. An external inquiry was ordered straight away. Yet within weeks, he'd been removed from his ministerial post for allegedly undermining staff morale with his critical comments about his staff. This, he was told, broke the ministerial code of conduct. Back then, Mr Sivray found himself being thought of as either a menace or a martyr. There were a few politicians on my side, it is true, but back then, before people were aware of the police investigation, when it came to seriously fighting this matter and really fighting for the survivors, I, I was, in truth, alone in the Assembly. You know, I was just seen uh, as being somebody that was raising a very controversial and toxic subject and it was very difficult to get any real serious political support at that stage. Ten years on, he's been vindicated by the inquiry. But back to 2008, and what was the truth about that potential bit of skull that had been sent away for tests? If it was a human fragment, the implication was chilling. In the event, the fragment was thought to be too old to include in the inquiry. The off-island media who'd salivated over the thought of a murder probe packed up and left. In August, Lenny Harper retired. Three months later, his boss, Chief of Police Graham Power, was suspended a controversy that's still causing political fallout. Operation Rectangle was shut down in 2010, having made just a handful of prosecutions. The states apologised to the victims and offered them financial compensation. And a proper independent inquiry, this inquiry, was promised. Which brings me back to today and the safety of children in Jersey. Ten years after Operation Rectangle and 27 years since the Maguire's sadistic regime was first known of, services for children are still not fully fit for purpose. Children, the inquiry found, may still be at risk. The news did not come as a surprise to today's Health and Social Services Minister, Andrew Green. Hello, Hello Mr Green. Sorry to keep you no, waiting. No, not at all. I know you're busy. Thank Just, you. Well, the... Come in. Because the expert brought in to shake up Jersey's childcare, Josephine Olsen, had told her bosses two years ago that she'd found a moribund department run by managers out of their depth and reluctant to change. She discovered that six cases of child sexual abuse, two in residential care and four within families, had not been properly dealt with, leaving children unprotected sometimes for years. Jo Olson was brought in by the previous minister uh, because she, the previous minister recognised that things were drastically wrong within the children's service. I had the privilege of working with Jo for about a year and uh, she made an outstanding contribution to the improvement of services. It's thanks to her, for example, jointly we agreed that we would put in a children's uh, improvement plan. She said that Jersey had been humiliated and ashamed by the scandal and that nobody had learnt anything from Operation Rectangle. I, th I think she's right. We, the lessons were not learnt. They were not the lessons... What the guarantees are they going to be that they're going to learn them this time then? Well, we've, we've given an absolute guarantee that we will do that. We'll do this as an assembly, as a government, so it's, it's everybody's responsibility. I have always taken the view that we should look after our own children, looked after children in the same way as we look after our own children. We need to improve that, and we, we have improved it, but we've got more to do. Much more to do, says one politician, if his experience is anything to go by. I, I'm one of the people who is fed up hearing of special case reviews into failings of the system. And I think we're on our sixth one. We just finished the sixth. And every time we're told lessons have been learned. But very often they're the same lessons. And I don't believe they've learned the lessons. 
Mike Higgins has been fighting a lengthy battle for one of his constituents whose two children have been in care on and off for years. As he told the inquiry, he says their mother has been denied access to vital medical records. And I'm absolutely convinced that there was abuse, both sexual uh, and emotional abuse, certainly, depending on which child, uh, during the time they were in care. And all I can say is that uh, with the opposition that I've received from the authorities, it just makes me more convinced they're hiding something. I feel very, very strongly that the system is failing them even at the present time. Given that every society harbours child abusers and there have been tragic deaths of children in care elsewhere, what is it about Jersey that makes this story unique? If all that springs to mind when you think about Jersey are those pretty brown cows and costly little spuds, here's a brief history lesson. For that, I've come to the beach. It's a beautiful, wide, flat, sandy beach. The tide's way out at the moment and the sun's just trying to glimmer through the clouds. There's a castle in the distance, Mont Orgoy or Mount Pride. It and Jersey was once owned by the Duke of Normandy in France, which is just a baguette's toss away across the Channel. Jersey French was spoken and still is among a few. When William the Norman Conqueror nabbed the British crown in 1066, he brought the Channel Islands with him. But it's not part of the UK, it's a crown dependency and answers to the Queen. She appoints the top jobs of the bailiff and attorney general. Apart from that, Her Majesty lets Jersey get on with things pretty much undisturbed. That's why it can set its own very low and very attractive tax rates. Trillions of pounds wash in and out of here, like the sea on the sands I'm standing on. The money trade makes up nearly half the economy and supports thousands of British jobs, while Jersey royal potatoes are, quite literally, small potatoes now. Jersey makes its own laws, some even now written only in French, and can dictate who buys property and who cannot. Outsiders coming here to work have to wait 10 years to buy a home, making recruiting staff, like social workers, a constant problem. Quirkily, Jersey has two police forces, an honorary parish network and the state police. Only the parish constables have the power to charge people, they also hold hearings called parish hall inquiries to deal with some offences. The heads of each parish police force, all 12 of them, get an automatic seat in the States. Another troll comment, so that won't be getting published. It's about the hundredth troll comment I've had on this blog. It's that entrenched power held by the few, which for some, like blogger Neil McMurray, embodies what that taxi driver mentioned to me, the so-called Jersey Way. Well, the, the Jersey Way to people like me, campaigners like myself, um, is cover up corruption, collusion, destroying anybody who speaks up and speaks out. Neil and other bloggers have been digging away at the child abuse story for years, doing the work he says the professional media weren't doing. What we did, what, what's happened with blogging, from being a very, very angry, resentful and bitter... Sort of resistance movement. Resistance movement. We sort of, if you like, learned our trade and we gained the trust and confidence of some pretty high-level whistleblowers. We've been leaked documents by these whistleblowers. We've gained the trust and the confidence of them. So, you know, we've gained the trust and the confidence of the victims and survivors and including, you know, whistleblowers who rather come to us than go to the media. So they you've think, had a huge influence? I don't know if huge is right. It's difficult to say. Chief Officer Graham Power, who I interviewed yesterday for my blog, and others um, have said if it wasn't for the blogs that this care inquiry wouldn't be happening anyway. The inquiry heard lots of evidence about the Jersey Way, from people concerned at how intertwined and so potentially compromised the legal and the political apparatus are. One outspoken former politician, Trevor Pittman, described how he received a bullet through the post. On it was a paper luggage tag with what he described as a threat, basically along the lines of how I needed to shut up, he said. The inquiry recommended that the fear factor and lack of trust must be addressed. Mike Higgins... Another outspoken politician agrees. You have to understand that we have a system of government here which suits the people who run the island. What will it take to affect the cultural change in Jersey that the inquiry identified was needed if childcare is to be brought into the 21st century? We've got to make government more accountable for a start. At the present time, 
uh, with the state's chamber as it is, it is not properly accountable. Trying to get answers or to hold people to account is almost impossible. I can't remember, for example, when a civil servant was fired or a minister would be held properly to account and he resigns. Are there then chinks in the establishment armour, thanks to this inquiry? Minister Andrew Green seems convinced. The report says there needs to be a change in government and particularly looking at the separation of the judiciary from the uh, government and that needs to be done. But what we're talking about here is a whole community change. And I think the community, if, if the community takes the time to read that report, which is in that bag there, and read the individual stories, they can't help but be moved to have to make a change. It brings tears to your eyes when you read the individual stories. Attitudes to those families whose kids went into care are changing, although it's remarkable to think that until 2002, the poor relied for welfare on the say-so of the parish bigwigs, who could dispense charity or not as they saw fit. One remark in particular stands out from the mass of evidence. It was, let the needy people do what my Portuguese workers do, fork rats in the fields and eat them. That wasn't from the 19th century, but the 1980s. Well, what do you want, beige? Um, Tomatoes? Another tin of beans. Right? Beans, rice. Today, the less well-off go to food banks. Jersey has three of them, and one, the Grace Trust, even does home deliveries. Around 65 families get basic groceries once a month. Binny, one of the workers, is taking me on a tour of some of the estates he goes to. So we're in, in, entering a very nice-looking, modern yeah, yeah, they estate. Yeah, they really good, really good. Um, but you, but you deliver here? Sorry? But you deliver here? We would deliver here because, like I say, what, what appears to be great on the outside, it's what is actually on the inside is what the issue is about. You know what I mean? But, but you know, it's that, like I say, the exterior is one thing, it's the interior, and the interior is where the home is, you know? Um, you can have it as jazzy as you like on the outside, but if, uh, if there ain't love in there and if there's, there's, there's not a happy mum and dad in there, as a child growing up, it don't matter where you live, you know, you can paint my house any colour you want, but if my mum and dad aren't happy, you know, then it's a different life to grow up in, isn't it? The Grace Trust HQ is a neat terraced house in central St Helier, where anyone in need can drop in for coffee, a chat or some food. Jerry's the manager here. Some nuts. Some nuts? No, I don't eat nuts. I don't eat nuts. I'm nuts already. Ah, do me like you know, you know, get good. You? No, I'm not a good person. Like you, sir. It's the most expensive island on the planet, isn't it? <laughs> it's the most expensive island on the planet. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me, like. <laughs> Costs you to fart over here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Put that on the radio. Fart taxi. Right, cheers, Jerry. <laughs> okay, nice good to see you. Well, I know a lot of people um, here are working, aren't they? People who come to you and use Absolutely. your food bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them are working, but they they they're struggling to make ends meet because you've got the minimum wage, and it's a zero hour contracts, which is a, a big problem over here, because if you, if if you're trying to budget, you can't do it as as a couple. If you, if one of you's got a zero hour contract, you need one of you at least to be the main the main the main earner needs to have a, a proper contract, because zero hour contracts they can just drop you. You can go to work at nine o'clock this morning and send you home at ten. We work on the coal face. My, when I left school, I always wanted to be a miner, a bit of Geordie, and um, my grandfather said to me, he says under my over my dead body you'll go in the pit, son. Uh, but now I, I keep seeing that people work. We actually actually are working on the coal face, the society now. So I've become a miner, indirectly. Uh, we're dealing with people who've got all the problems in the world at the moment. and uh, Some of them have been in care? Yes. Poverty, inadequate housing, drunken parents. The inquiry heard many pathetic accounts from children put into care for just these reasons. One child went into a home while her mother worked all hours in order to afford a telly. Another boy wound up in Haute de la Garenne for stealing stale cake. Or they were placed in the hands of private foster parents. In 1978, a two-year-old boy died at the hands of his foster mother. He went there because his parents' home was too cramped to keep him all the time. That case helped change Jersey's law governing children's welfare and rights, a law which hadn't been looked at since its introduction in 1969. This is the law which says children under 15 cannot be put in prison. 
Yet, as lawyer Alan Collins told the inquiry, it was effectively being broken for years. So, Alan, we're standing by the magistrate's court where, years ago, children were treated shockingly, I would think you would say. What happened? It looks as though there are serious questions that need to be asked about the placing of children in Le Chien. Now, Le Chien was meant to be a children's home and it ended up, it would appear, to have been used as a children's prison. There are, both nationally and internationally, lots of various rules and regulations that restricts the state's ability to lock children up. And Jersey seems to have thought that it had the need to lock young teenagers up, children aged 12, 13, 14 and so on. And so various um, legal devices were deployed, for example, putting a child on probation, but saying, well, we're putting you on probation, but you're going to live at Le Chien. Other children were remanded repeatedly while waiting to be dealt with by the court. Basically, it looks as though that was another way of keeping, keeping, them, off the the child, keeping them off the streets, and keeping that child in custody. And what lengths of time are we talking about here? Well, in an inquiry... Um, the states of Jersey um, produced um, statistics which seems to have shown that some of these children were at Le Chien for very long periods of time, going into years. So why were children shut away so eagerly by the court? Because, as one chair of governors at Le Chien opined, the place was full of little villains. Unfortunately, lots of vulnerable children ended up mixing with the harder kids. And if it wasn't them they were bullied by... It was the staff. I spoke to a man who, as an 11-year-old, was sent to Le Chien in the 1980s for stealing £400. He'd been in care since the age of six and was treated well. Things changed when he went inside Le Chien. He told me how, as a 13-year-old, he just had a shower when one staff member, smelling of booze, grabbed him by the neck and pinned him against the wall. He says he still remembers that night like it was yesterday. The regime was strict. Children were caned and put in solitary confinement. That happened to him twice. They had to earn points before being allowed home. Points were taken away for the slightest slip in behaviour. More than 30 years since his time in Le Chien, the man I spoke to still isn't sure on what legal basis he was sent there. He's not alone. It does seem to me that, on the face of it, some of the children concerned may well have been falsely imprisoned. And presumably are now waiting to see what their action they can take. Well, the young people concerned are now, as a result of what emerged at the inquiry, saying, well, I was in Le Chien and I spent a long time in Le Chien and I was placed in solitary confinement, which is another issue. Was that, in fact, legal? Even if children had the courage to complain, who would they go to? The state was indifferent. There was no system for children to report what was happening. The residential care home staff were untrained and badly managed. Some were notoriously cruel, like Morag Jordan, who was jailed with her husband Tony for assaulting children at Haute de la Garenne. Oh, I was, I was terrified of her. Marilyn Carey did night shifts at Haute de la Garenne and other homes when she was a young childcare officer. Runaways were common and had to be stopped. If they went to run out the door... Um, a member of staff, one member of staff, would uh, sit on the child's shoulders face down and somebody would sit further down, not their whole weight, of course, but enough to sit astride them rather than on them. Did you do that? I was instructed to and there was one occasion when I was very upset afterwards but I did it because I was told I had to. That was my duty. For example, if I'd said, I wouldn't have dared say to Morag, no, I'm not doing that, I don't think it's good practice. Because it, I, was, I was just too scared. Marilyn's day job was a field worker visiting troubled families and sometimes taking their children into care. And I remember one little boy once, I had to put him in my car and take him to Haute de la Garenne. And he cried all the way and said to me, but Marilyn, you promised, you promised that I wouldn't have to go back. Eau de la Garenne was a place with little human warmth. There was nothing there that made you think that this was a child's home. And you went into the children's rooms 
and they might have a little picture on the wall that they had of their brothers or sisters that they brought with them or something like that. But there was nothing like, you know, it was very rare you saw cuddly toys or, or things that you would normally see in a child's bedroom. That it didn't feel like a home, it felt more like a, well, like a cell. Marilyn is now a counsellor and sees lots of adults she knew as children in the homes. She feels guilty that she didn't do more to help them then. But I would just take things to my line manager and just assume that because I'd taken them to a line manager, that's all I needed to do. And I now feel ashamed of that. I should have, even though I was young, I should have had the courage to question. And I didn't because I was afraid. The island is now watching its politicians closely to see if their remorse is genuine. Minister Andrew Green says it is. I went to school with a lot of these people and I'm ashamed that they didn't feel safe to tell me that they had problems. We've got to change that. It's got to be a whole... The cultural shift has got to be a whole community shift. It's got to be led by government, but it's got to be a whole community shift. But those seeking wider changes say the UK government, which is, after all, ultimately responsible for its Crown dependencies, should cast a gimlet eye over how Jersey is being run. Mike Higgins has previously asked the UK to step in, but with no success. They won't intervene in the island for individual cases, so we can show them examples of failings in the judicial system, police system or whatever, and how people have been badly treated, but they won't act. And it's my belief that the only time they'll act is if we've got rioting in the streets. Is that likely any time soon? Unfortunately not. Until the Jersey officials, the Jersey oligarchy starts to feel fear that it's going to be held to account and properly scrutinised, vulnerable people in Jersey will never truly be safe. That's Stuart Sivray, who stood up for abuse victims and paid the price. His political career was ended, his blogs got him jailed for breaching data protection laws. Meeting Stuart for the first time in a long time, I realise how much he's been affected by the traumatic stories of victims who came to him for help. For some of these people, they had never tell, told anyone else even. And I mean, for example, there was one occasion I, 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 I met a man, I had to meet him in immense secrecy in the early hours of the morning in a St Helier back lane. And that kind of meeting was not uncommon because so many people were terrified of being seen to speak with me. They were frightened of the Jersey establishment. So I had to go to great lengths to meet um, in secrecy with a lot of people. But this man had to meet me in a back lane and he told me how he'd been taken into care in Haut de la Garenne as a child. And after the death of his remaining parent outside of the home, uh, he started to be raped by States of Jersey employees. Uh, he told me their identity. But once he told me this, it suddenly, and he had never told anyone else, and he, he broke down. Sorry. He, um, yeah, he, he broke down, he cried like a child on my shoulder. So can I answer the question I asked at the start? Have I seen history in the making? I think I have. Change is in the wind. Haute de la Garenne, the house of horrors, may be demolished and the children who endured have finally been heard. After living through a turbulent and often cruel childhood, a failed court case, years of homelessness, the police investigation and now this inquiry, Darren Pico has survived. He has children of his own. I promise my kids, I'll never let them down. And they'll never be without their dad. And they'll never go without. And they will never experience anything like I did. And no one will ever hurt them. Simple as that.